Hi, if you are a seizure patient and you are not a trauma survivor, I in no way mean to make this correlation for you or undermine your neurological experience. I am a seizure patient. I have been since I've been 18 months old. Um, I have vagal induced grand mal seizures. So a lot of people in my field, they talk about syncope and how the vagus nerve makes them pass out. Um, that's not what happens for me. Syncope creates a grand mal seizure. So my heart stops and the way that I have been told about it my whole life, because what happened in the beginning is I fell down a, um, my cellar steps into a well, a literal hole in the ground that had water in it when I was 18 months old and the steps are concrete. Um, that was when I had my first seizure and my mom thought I was being bad and put me to bed. And then she took me to the doctor because it kept happening. And the doctor told her for a year and a half that I was having temper tantrums. Um, hence my like apprehension and ambivalence about the medical system, right? So um, I was literally punished for having seizures until I was three and I was diagnosed with CHOP. And they told my parents that by actually putting me into a seizure under an EEG, they like did something where they pushed up into my eyes and threw me into a seizure that my vagus nerve is the culprit and that it is sending a signal to my heart to stop. And when my heart stops, that's the convulsion. I'm losing oxygen. There's no oxygen to my brain. I'm having a full-fledged seizure. So where I've been, right, because um, I'm sure some of you have noticed I've been a little bit on pause from sharing or being visible, um, this year, I was going to do the adult thing and go get um, a life insurance policy for my family. And because of um, when I was pregnant with my last son, my OB needed clearance from my neurologist for me to be allowed to have a natural childbirth, which I want to also talk to you about in a second. Um, natural childbirth after two C-sections. So I go to get my um, life insurance policy and they see that the neurologist said that I'm supposed to go to an electrophysiologist or a cardiologist first, cardiologist, and after I have the baby. So the life insurance company puts my case on pause, says they're going to deny it if like anything comes back not right, but they're going to put it on pause until I go get this workup. So I'm thinking I'm going to go get this workup. It's going to be totally fine. Um, and I get the Zeo patch the first time and it shows that I have a second degree AV heart block. And so the insurance company denies me and the cardiologist refers me to an electrophysiologist because obviously it's my circuitry. It's my electro, like it's my electricity that is actually the issue. Um, not just, it's not like the functionality of my heart. It's the circuitry. And, you know, I come from a family that always said, oh, you're getting on my nerves, you're getting on my nerves. Here, this, you're literally on my nerves, right? My nerves are, something's wrong with my nerves. So um, I go back and it shows that I have brachycardia the second time. So, um, or it's like, I think that's what it was. It was like seven extra beats per second or something. Um, and they want me to put a, what is called a loop monitor in where they literally open my skin and put a titanium rod that's about that big in for two years next to my heart to monitor my heart. I am way too texturally awkward to receive that. So they were, it was very evident to them that, um, I like, and it was, it's very evident to me. My quality of life would be destroyed. Like I would always be focused on, you know, how many, you have kids and they're like always focused on their boo-boo. Like that's what my mind would always be focused on this metal thing. And I would be, I would be grounded to sickness is my belief. Right. And I'm willing to change my beliefs about this. So the guy says, you should go see a therapist. So, okay, I'm going to do that because I love my body. I've healed it before. I shouldn't say I have healed it. It has healed on my behalf before through the work that I've done. So I dig around for some therapists and ironically, I find this woman and we connect and we talk and then I stalk her on, you know, she's like not, there's no pictures of her or whatever. So I stalk her to trying to find more info after we talk. 
and I realized she was my childhood piano teacher. And she was, uh, you know, in my family, if you messed up, it was like, you're done, you're an idiot, just stop, like, go sit down, get off the stage, basically. And I remember being, and there's a lot, if you've read or, uh, Imperfectly Sane, you know that, like, my mom would, she would beat the shit out of me for not practicing piano and then scream at me and say, you're quitting today. And then we'd get there and I'd be all, all amped up. Okay, I'm going to quit. Thank God. I don't want to have to like practice or play and get beat anyway. Like, I don't want to do this. So then we'd get there and then she'd be like, yeah, I didn't raise a quitter. You better not quit. Right? Like, um, I remember she'd rip me out by my hair to get to piano lessons. If I was not like playing on the time of the metronome or whatever, like her intention for me was to be a concert pianist. Right? And I was pretty damn good. I had an ear, um, but I was never allowed to explore or play the piano. I was always forced to practice on a metronome and there was nothing, there was no lightness about learning whatsoever. So this is a little bit triggering, right? This, but this piano teacher, um, she, I was so angry that I messed up. I was probably nine years old at this recital. And I thought if I just bang on the keys in front of all of these people, they're just going to think I'm crazy and tell me to get off. And like, I, then I can just go cry in a corner and be by myself. And I, it'd be better than all these people watching me. Right. So that's not what happened. She came up to me and she told me to try again. I think she might've been the first person in my entire life that ever told me it was okay to make a mistake and to try again. So I agreed to go to her because I feel a sense of when I was a child, I was curious and open to other people. I wanted other experiences than the ones that I had. And I was like really thirsty for them. And she was kind of a weirdo. She had like, she lit incense. She would say, you need to go to the chiropractor. My mom would think she was crazy. And since then she shut down her studio and she has rheumatoid arthritis. So her hands or her hand is deformed. Um, so she doesn't teach piano anymore. And she became a therapist. She got her PhD and something along the lines of, you know, art therapy and somatic therapy. So I've done a lot of somatic work to heal myself to get to the point that I have. Um, and so I'm going to her and she turns me on to Peter Levine's work. And all of a sudden, the dots of um, the dots are connecting about the functionality of my seizures and the oh, I love my body. I am so humbly gifted this amazing body that has done so much work on my behalf. Um, and now I realize because I'm afraid of having seizures at this point because in my last seizure, I it was the worst one I've had. I mean, it, I was out for two and a half minutes. I was completely blue. And I had impressions while I was in the seizure, which was the first time that ever happened. And what was happening was I was driving the car, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of fear associated with knowing, like when I was younger and I had seizures, I didn't really have a lot to lose. It was like an escape. Thank God I just had a seizure, right? Now they'll leave me alone. Um, but I don't want to have that. Now I have an amazing life. So I, I need to retrain my body. That's what I want to talk about today. I need to retrain my body that seizures, although they were a function at one point of my survival, they are not necessary in my survival now. And I have zero doubt that what's happening is that my vagus nerve is still activated sometimes and causing, and this is ironic because my heart block actually happened in my sleep. Um, so, and I do have a little bit of sleep disturbance. I have, I wake up with sleep paralysis very often um, where I'm like trying to yell to somebody to wake me up because I have no access to my body, but I am mentally awake. And that has happened to me sometimes in seizures. But, um, so I'm reading Peter Levine's work and I want to prep, like, just give you a wrap up of this, right? So I am also in the middle of my own work um, on creating epic content about um, boundaries and the nature of them instead of this implicit moral thing associated with them that we have in psychology, but the biological nature of boundaries. So I can... Um, help my kind of demographic who tends to spiritualize them really embody them and understand that their body um we we are people who we're not allowed to have boundaries with our own bodies and so it can feel really invasive even to set a boundary for ourselves because it feels like we're stepping out into somebody else when really that's not what we're doing we're just standing in our own position um but oftentimes 
we struggle with boundaries and I want to make it more about the animal so that they can really get in their guts about it. So as you know, I'm writing about this, my therapist turns me on to Peter Levine's work and he talks about how in nature, so say the gazelle knows it's about to get eaten by a lion and we've all heard this, but I want you to stick with me, right? Because it, it was really reframed for me in a different way with my seizures. If so, there's this gazelle, it understands, and I find it so ironic that in Earn Your Lock, I did write about wishing I was the inadequate fawn that, that my parents would leave behind. At the time, I didn't even know about complex PTSD, I didn't even know about the fawning response. I was just writing from complete experience, right? So, um, in the wild, the gazelle will fawn basically, it will, it has an automatic response that will help it to be dead essentially in the time that the lion puts its mouth on it so it will have a complete freeze response where all of its body shuts down and that would be what maybe we would call syncope right i'm on the ground i'm done i don't have syncope so this is the distinction right I have full-fledged grandma seizures. I'm twitching. I'm pissing myself. I'm technically swallowing my tongue and maybe shitting myself. It depends. But there is this associated with what I do. This has probably saved my life now that I'm learning about Peter Levine. This has legitimately been the functionality of my seizures. And what I mean by this is he talks about in in nature, when the gazelle wakes up, so say the, the gazelle is drug someplace to feed the lion's cubs and it wakes up before the lion gets back, it will wake up and shake itself off. Just like every animal you ever see wake up, will wake up and stretch. It doesn't just get up unless there's like something to attack. It like gets up and stretches, right? So the gazelle will get up and shake itself off and then it will run like hell for safety, right? Until it feels safe. In my experience, in my trauma, there was nowhere to run, ever. There was, if I tried to run, it would have been 50,000 times worse. My body knew that since I was 18 months old, which is, again, like, my body is so intuitive. I love her. I love this body. Um, and I used to hate her. I used to vehemently hate my body. I was taught to hate my body. Um, by people who hated their bodies. And of course they hated mine. I represented some sense of reality to them that they didn't want to face. So, and that was me. I didn't want to face the realities of, oh, I'm having a seizure. It's out of my control, blah, blah, blah. But now I understand the functionality of my own body. So in nature, yeah, buddy. Okay, my son might be coming in in a second, but um, in nature, there's going to be this period of shake off and they're going to run and they're going to be fine then. And that's when their nervous system, basically that's why Peter Levine theorizes that animals don't experience a sense of trauma because they have a biological mechanism for shaking it off. So for me, the last time I had a seizure, it's so disturbing to think that before I remembered all of the thoughts that I had that created fear in me, when I woke up and I realized I had a seizure, my first thought was, oh, that was an interesting reset. And another thing I want to say is I have never had a seizure not under my mother's reign. So even the last time I was with her, I had a seizure. And, you know, I talked about this in another video, I think, but the olfactory aspect, I think, was also there because I was at a horse farm when I was a kid. I used to volunteer at the horse farm next to my grandparents who raised me every summer because I wanted to take horseback riding lessons so I would shovel shit all day. And my mom and I were at a horse farm and I had a seizure. And of course, my father is absent like usual. He's like not even in the proximity. And that's always how it's been. I pretended to have a seizure one time just to get his attention when I was like probably seven years old. I did legitimately fall down the steps, but then I pretended to have a seizure at the bottom of the steps. He finished his sandwich before he came to check on me. Okay, like this is the life that my body lived, punished for seizures, um, ignored through them. And so my mom is there with me. My father's absent, but somewhere on the proximity as usual. And 
of course, it's my mom who saves me from the seizure, basically. She's screaming, but she thinks to herself, she tells me when I come out of it, thank God you came out of it. I couldn't, I don't want to have to raise your kids, right? Like she doesn't even, she's not thinking about me at all. She's not thinking about my experience or what just happened to me. She's literally thinking, oh my God, how is this going to affect me? I'm going to have to raise these kids now. So my seizures in Peter Levine's world and the way that I received this work and really like brought it in, my seizures probably have been the reason because I think about it. And I go, dude, I could have been so fucked up. I could have been, I think like I'm not, I'm probably never going to be normal but I could have been, I could have been, I could have stayed in hell for the rest of my life. It would have been easier probably, right? Um, but I've always had glimmer of hope and glimpses of light from the little cages that people locked me in. I would always just look for the light like I tell my daughter. Just look to the light, look to the crack under the door where you can see a little bit of light. I've done that my whole life. And I think in a way, my seizures have been the biological manifestation of that for me. Because when I would wake up from the convulsions, guess what would ha happen? Everybody would be staring at me or um, somebody would provoke seizures in me. Like my sisters used to shoot me in the eye with like water guns and I'd make me have seizures or people would provoke seizures or people would, I would wake up. I remember waking up one time, the most popular girl in school was handing my teacher towels to clean up my urine. Oh my God. Um, while the whole entire class was like over on the stage, just staring at me. I didn't want to be looked at, right? The gazelle would get up and run to safety. There was, I ran to my mother, <laughs> right? There's no safety. There's no safety there. So this, I, I recognize, he talks about how people have fear of getting into the immobile state. And pe people have fear of coming out of the immobile state. And I have been a person, I think traditionally and somatically, been a person who fears coming out of the immobilized state and that's why I like to sleep, right? Like I'm a sleeper. I love to sleep. I'm also a wicked, um, like I do a lot of work in my sleep. I'm a, a dreamer. I do a lot of like shamanic work in my sleep with people. Um, but I think that there has been this awareness that there's nowhere to run. And the only way to discharge the energy is to actually have a full-fledged seizure, not fawn, not freeze and have syncope, but have a full-fledged seizure and then I would have a seizure and then there'd be like sometimes I'd end up in the hospital or there'd be strangers looking at me and I'd be like oh my god you know there's still nowhere to run so I could shake it off but there's not that running thing and I think that what I'm trying to train my body right now is that like you are strong enough to run and there's actually safe places for you to run so in this one of the things that we talk about in psychology is like repetition compulsion this this idea that we as Adults will repeat experiences that are, and Levine turns it into biology, that our biology legitimately needs to find ways, so it will recreate an external experience, and our biology will find ways to discharge the original trauma, the original energy that we need discharged to move on from that trauma, because the body remembers. Where in animals, the bodies have these biological mechanisms to shake it off so that they don't hold the bodily memory the way that a, a human with consciousness in their body does. So, um, and maybe if you, you know, held the animal down, it would have the same experience. It would remember the trauma. It would be in its body about it. But most animals in the wild do not have that experience. Maybe domestic animals do. So, um, this repetition compulsion, my seizures would be basically that, right? Like, oh, she's coming in at me. The only way to make her stop is to literally be dead for a second. But she didn't really care anyway. That, but it was a survival mechanism. It was a functionality. Ready? Right? Okay. So then there's these two other times in my life when I can think, oh my God, I could have been so, I could have been so like disturbed and stayed in horrible situations. And I'm so glad that my body and my, like everything just didn't work out that way. Like I'm, I look at it and go, how the hell am I even normal? Right? So when I was in my twenties, I dated this guy. Um, and there was a switch that happened when this night happened where I was like, never again. Right? Like I just knew it was never going to happen again. I was never going to get into a narcissistic relationship again. And he was the easiest to escalate the fastest. And, um, he was incredibly calculated. So, um, we dated for two months 
and he was talking about, I'm going to live with him. He wanted, he didn't, he was like making finance. I bought a new washer and dryer in my own house and he like gave me shit about it. Um, he had, he was huge. He was a really big guy. He had a propensity towards violence as it was. Um, he one night came to my house and slept over and acted like everything was normal. And we had been fighting, um, as it was, but he just said, okay, I'm going to come over. My kid, he, I put my kids on the bus the next day and I came inside and he had taken my phone. He had destroyed my fucking whole upstairs, flipped my bed, shattered a bunch of pictures, locked me in the bathroom. Mind you, he has my phone. I'm vulnerable in my shower and he's screaming at me to tell him that I'm a whore. And I am, I don't care how big you are. Like I dealt with my mother. Like, I'm not going to tell you. You're not going to tell me what I am, and I'm not going to tell you what you think I am, because it's none of your fucking business what I am. I've known you for two months, right? So, of course, I don't tell him what he wants me to hear, but I'm naked. I'm, like, get, like, shaking, you know, doing the shaking thing, like, oh, my God, get out, get out of my face, like, you know, and I, in those moments, you can't display vulnerability, because, oh, my God, you'd be dead. So, what I do is act cool when I he like moves out of the way after I'm like get the fuck out of my way I, I see my whole house is destroyed I put my clothes on I walk down the stairs all calm like I'm gonna fight with him basically and I fucking run run out of my house like half naked run all the way to my sister's house and she was like you know lived like five blocks from me at the time and I come on her couch and I just sob on her couch and she holds me um and she was always like my favorite sister when I was a kid. She was the only one who was like relatively nice to me. And that was usually sometimes, but I knew that she like, even she tried to be nice to me. Um, and I, it was the running. I realized in Peter Levine's book, when I go, oh, why did I, like what healed me that day where I just knew there was a switch in me and that I was like, never again. I'm never putting myself in that position again. Um, I was in that position my whole life. My mom would corner me constantly and either hit me or grab my fist and try to make me hit her. And I ran after the, like, get out of my face, shaking, right? I actually had the bodily experience of physically running for my life. And then me and my sister walk back literally like two hours later and he's still here, right? Um, but my sister is with me. So I say, where's my phone? He gets pissed, slams, he puts my phone out, slams the door, walks out, leaves, and only calls me like a week later to tell me what a whore I am, right? So um, my body had this experience of literally fighting for my own life in a way that I, there was somewhere to run. I ran to my sisters, right? So this repetition compulsion ended because my body, my biology cleared the story. I know I have resources. I know there's somewhere to run. I know I can run, right? I didn't have that when I was growing up. And because I was able to do it, I cleared the, oh, I'm going to be in relationships with narcissists my whole life. Another sense of repetition compulsion, which I recognize so wholly, um, this is a big story for me because I want people to know the power. And I didn't even know this about Peter Levine's work at the time, but I had two C-sections back to back. They told me I would never be allowed to have natural childbirth, especially on top of my seizures, because my seizures are pain-induced vagal seizures, right? So if I hit a meridian that touches the vagus nerve, if I, anything that like goes wrong with the vagus nerve, basically, I'm having a seizure. So they told me, never, you're never going to have natural childbirth. I found somebody who was willing to take a chance on me who let me have natural childbirth. And I cannot, you know, it's one thing to have natural childbirth, and I think it's healing for anybody, but to be a person who... And I didn't want my C-sections to be a person who's been physically poked at and prodded at my entire life. And then to be told your body is not your own. So you have to have a C-section or else I will not deliver your baby. So I'm going to slice you open. And actually, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have an intern slice you open. Um, and I'm going to take your baby out because you're actually too something not right to do it. Um, I'm not saying don't be cautious. What I am saying is that I did not, and I let it happen because I believed that that was true at the time. I believed that I was, I was incapable of ha having natural childbirth. So I go through a 36 hour natural childbirth with my first, like my daughter. I had two after my two C-sections. So the first natural childbirth is 36 hours long of legitimate labor for 36 hours, but I never had the inclination to push. 
And then my doctor says, get in the shower because I wanted to have a water baby, but they didn't do water births. So I got in the shower. She came out after 36 hours. Every single time that they were going to take an intervention on my body, my body just, it, it did the thing. Like she was like, I'm going to break your water. And I was like, no, nah, okay, wait, wait. And then all of a sudden my water would break. Right. So, but the pushing, I've never wanted to be pushy. And I had to push somebody out and it feels painful for me to even consider pushing somebody. Like that's not who I want to be, right? And this is who I had to be in birth. I had to be all in my vertical self um, instead of like this horizontal, oh, this person sees me, what's going on here? Like I had to be all in here, right? So those two natural childbirths after two C-sections I feel in my body in a way that if I would have just had those C-sections, I would be probably always bitter and feel taken advantage of. Like somebody just came at me with a scalpel and just like ripped out my babies instead of me being connected to the entire experience and knowing. And then after it, like the vertical versus horizontal healing that happens when, when you're having a, a natural childbirth, there's a vertical healing that happens. And when you're having a uh, c-section there's a horizontal healing that happens and the vertical is just so much more natural it's just so much more dumping it's so it's just so much more cleansing than the stuckness of the horizontal c-section not downing anybody who chooses to have c-sections electively they're just not for me and i didn't want them for my body that's not what happened so the way i healed from that sense of violation truly that some man is just actually more powerful than me than i am and he's more in charge of my own babies and my own childbirth than I am. So I'm going to just let him do his thing versus, oh, I'm Mrs. Me here doing this. I needed that sense of healing. I don't have that repetition compulsion to put myself in situations anymore where I'm going to need a surgery. I'm going to need something that's going to be this powerful thing outside of myself that that is doing my job for me, basically. Okay, fast forward. They're telling me I need a freaking pacemaker ouch. Ah, oh, I thought I was beyond this, right? So <clears throat> again, I'm here going, okay, body. Okay, body. And I did this healing today. And this is really what I want to get to. And this is like part of what, you know, I'm going to write about. So don't you all take it if there's somebody out there trying to take my content. Um, I'm sure it's, you know, we all have similar thoughts, but, um, I watch Caesar Milan a lot. I think he's brilliant. Um, he knows, it's clear to me that he knows the same things that I know to be true in my body and in my soul. And one of the things that he talks about with dogs is the calm surrender, right? So you're not supposed to approach a puppy or a dog if it's excited because excitement to a dog can turn to aggression. And that's not because the dog is an aggressive dog. It's because their nervous system doesn't know the difference between excitement and fear, right? So if you have this uh, a person who's walking this dog that's really tense and they're afraid, the dog is actually going to respond to their fear by attacking things that come near it because the dog goes, oh my God, this is my owner. I'm going to protect my owner. He's afraid. I should be afraid. I'm going after you right? The instinct is fear, attack. And that can be really dangerous if you have a big dog or a dog who can legitimately hurt somebody. If you are an anxious person walking your dog. So Caesar Milan comes in and says, no, calm surrendered state. You only walk the dog when they're in a calm surrendered state. You have to be in a calm surrendered state because they feel you. So I watched this episode last night where he like blindfolds this dude um, and has him walk through this you know, obstacle course of dogs, basically, or uh, other animals. And because the guy doesn't know where the other animals are, and Caesar's with him, he's, he's walking the same dog on the exact same leash. But he doesn't have those, oh my god, there's a dog there, fears. He doesn't, yeah, he doesn't have that tension in his body of what's going to happen here. So um, the dog just walks through all the dogs, he's not afraid, right? He's not barking at the dogs, he's not attacking the dogs. So you can see that there's this leash that is this cord of energy between the dog and the owner, right? And it doesn't, you don't even have to have a leash there, but like that's a physical manifestation of the cord between them and the resonance between them. And yeah, if, you ha if you're anxious and you have that anxiety and your dog feels that anxiety, your dog is actually potentially prone to turn even on you because it fears for you. It fears that anxiety because they can sense your anxiety. 
So the calm surrender is what I really want you to hear. So I do this healing today for my heart. And it's like, you know, I'm always asking for miracles for my body. I've healed my body. They told me I had herpes and HPV. I no longer have them. Like I used to be a total food junkie, a bulimic. Like I, I have healed my body a lot. I know it's possible. So, um, I have this vision of my vagus nerve and my heart and the way that they interact with each other. And I actually see like on a mind level, my mind being the adult owner and my vagus nerve being the leash and my heart being the dog. And dogs represent loyalty, right? It will be loyal to its owner. So with this visual, I say, instead of, I always ask my heart, you know, like I'm always like kind of asking, okay, for more miracles for my heart, instead of just giving my heart miracles. And I feel bad because it feels depleted when I do that. Like, how can I ask you for more? You've been through so much. I know like, you know, how can I do that to you? instead of just gifting it miracles, right? So this sense of, you know, my, I say to my heart, like, what do you need? It's like nothing. I need nothing, just calm surrender, calm surrender. I am the dog. I am the dog. Your vagus nerve is the leash and your psyche and the emotionality attached and braided with it more specifically, which would make it the energy associated with it, is that's the thing that we're looking to stabilize. So the vagus nerve can be this like green light instead of a red light or a yellow light. And I feel like this whole past year, and that's why I'm taking some pause here from YouTube and whatnot, is it's been this yellow light where I've noticed like, oh, I am the anxious owner. I'm actually, I feel like this thing is more in control of me um, than anything. And it's really not. And I have to take a step back and pause and recognize like, okay, this is actually part of my flow for whatever reason. But as I'm doing this, I'm learning so much about the functionality of my seizures originally and how I have to retrain my body that no, we don't need to go into that anxious seizure state to get away anymore. Um, so I want to just, I want to leave you with that, that sense of, um, the metaphor of when I really tap into that, like, I don't, I'm going to do anything I can. I'm not getting that loop machine. I'm going to do anything I can to not get a pacemaker because it seems to me that's like the person, you know, coming and slicing me open and giving me a C-section and that's fine. Um, but I want to explore natural childbirth this time before I choose the C-section route, if that makes sense metaphorically. So, um, Part of that healing is recognizing that my vagus nerve is actually, and I, you know, I, I do a lot to heal myself. So it's like, it's uncomfortable and I'm still having to do that. Right. Um, and that my body is still talking and kind of saying like, Hey, you got a lot more work to do here to regulate this thing. My foot is totally asleep. Um, so the the metaphor of really realizing on a on an energetic level that my heart is the dog and my heart has been broken my heart has been sick um whenever i do heart chakra work i actually feel like i can cave i go i can't you i can't ask it for anything else like it's such a fragile being when really in every sense of the word that's why i was so triggered when i found out because i'm like i literally think that i live my life by my heart and if I'm really heartbroken, am I just like spewing shit onto people? Like, is that really what I'm like? I really like went through. Um, I wasn't I'm, I was not comfortable for the first few months of hearing the word pacemaker. Um, and now I feel like I have a little bit more of a grip on it, but it's still looming. Like I, I checked my heart the other day. I was an AFib. That's not right. I'm a 38 year old person. So um the metaphor of a knowing that my vagus nerve is for me and for a lot of people, it has been the, the reactor and it's, it's the leash 
It is the thing that connects me to my heart. And when my mind or my energy or my emotions, something olfactory or something mentally triggers me, my vagus nerve goes, oh, there's nowhere to run. So you might as well just do it that way because at least then they'll stay away, right? Um, but I'm retraining my whole body using many modes, right? And that's my goal this year. So I don't know how much I'm going to show up on here this year. Maybe a lot. I'm not sure. Um, it'll sh see how my heart wants to go. But my my goal this year is to strengthen home, close to home. Um, because I don't want to be a person who has to go through that every 10 years, get a new pacemaker, rely on something. I also don't want to have a stroke. So I don't want to be stupid. Um, but if my whole life they've told me it's the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the leash. And my work is not to even share my work with you or with my practice or be in practice, which I am. And I'm so grateful for my practice because it really supports my heart. Um, but my work is to be the calm surrender owner. The owner that is, I got us. I don't need my dog to protect me. I don't need my dog to feel fear because I feel fear. I have us because my heart is responding to me being the owner going, <gasps> there's another dog. Oh my God, what if it comes over here? And that tension is the tension, I believe in the way I feel it in my physical body of the leash pulling me tighter and tighter and making me more tense and more anxious instead of, <sighs> I pay more attention to myself when I'm in a calm surrendered state. Instead of paying attention to the, <gasps> I might need a pacemaker. <gasps> oh my God, they're telling me I need a pacemaker. <gasps> The body doesn't heal when it's on that leash getting choked, right? By that tension. Um, the body doesn't heal that way. The body heals with laughter in a calm, surrendered state. And it's really interesting to think I've done all this work to stabilize and be like halfway normal and to be centered and in my own position and know my position and know who I am and create my own identity and be the character that I am not this like performance of a character that I should be, right? I've done all of this work and still, um, they tell me I need a pacemaker and still I have to be willing to surrender to whatever that means in a calm surrendered space going, the source that that is me, I recognize on a biological level there's this tension between the leash between us, but the source that is me has me. But sometimes I think I need an owner to shock me, which is what I wrote a lot about in Earn Your Luck, right? I always felt like I was just being zapped with an electric shock collar every time I was myself. <clears throat> I still think I need this owner to zap me and remind me there's nowhere to run, Stacy. Might as well just give out, have a seizure, be, you know, helpless so that they stop hurting you. Um... So this year is me rewriting that in my body. Um, and hopefully I can, you know, inspire you if you're somebody who is in any way, like experiencing these repetition compulsion and relationships or, or in your behaviors or in your body with your illnesses, realizing through Peter Levine's work that like getting up and shaking it off and actually mobilizing our bodies that's the thing that heals trauma. So I like really the profundity of saying that the reason that I knew last time, which I didn't know why I knew, I just thought, oh, there's this switch in me that happened. Maybe it's the cutoff switch. Like, I don't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, but now I go, oh my God, that was my body going, yeah, I had someone to run, fucker. You're not going to hurt me this time, right? So just knowing that those things, like trauma actually happens when we come out of it, through the whole biological process and then run from the thing that caused it. You run from the lion. You don't run back toward it. I only had the lion to run back toward. So knowing now and re putting myself in, like I have put myself in a whole new Petri dish, but sometimes it's obvious to me now. My body is not aware that we're here. So I'm, this year is me getting it time to catch up. So that's where I've been. Um, and I hope that this is helpful for, for you in some way, um, shape or form, just, uh, I've healed myself before and I feel, you know, how can I keep asking source for all these miracles? How can I do this? Um, and I think that's what source is saying. Hey, I'm here. 
when you ask, I know that you know that I'm here. Um, so there's that. I hope you all are well. Happy New Year.